this little painting back in the studio now and I'm gonna finish it up here. I've got a reference photo from that day. I've used the same photo that I took that morning out on the side of the road. I didn't quite get finished out there. The sun became too brutal and it was kind of a exposed spot on the side of the road. I got what I wanted down, the color harmony and the composition, the feel of the place, and I took a bunch of reference photos. So I've put together a reference photo that I'm going to use to finish the painting off. It's here on my iPad. First up, I'll take a palette knife and scrape down the painting. Just knock off any high ridges, any dust or bugs that may have got on the painting while I was painting outdoors. Then I'll take a rag with just a little bit of refined linseed oil and rub that into the painting. I take just a little bit of refined linseed oil. Here I'm using Gamblin's linseed oil on a clean piece of t-shirt cloth. I like the t-shirt cloth because it doesn't shed fibers very easily. So just a little bit on the t-shirt is enough. I'll rub that in and make sure there's no excess left. That's only necessary. You only need to oil in the painting, rub in the linseed oil if the painting has dried completely, dried to the touch. If it's still wet, tacky, you don't need to rub in additional oil. Here's a great little hack if you're kind of miserly with your good quality oil paints like I am. I got this ceiling watercolor palette. I think my wife actually bought it for me at Michael's. It wasn't cheap, but it, it does a good job, so it's worth it, I think. I take my leftover paint that I want to save at the end of each day, so all the pure colors I have here in this outside ring and all my mixes and my white I have in these middle pans. So anything that would seal, it doesn't even have to seal airtight, it just has to have a, a lid. Um, I put it away at the end of the day after, the, after I've painted. I put it in the freezer and that keeps it from drying out. Even if you have liquid, like I have some liquid mixed into some of these colors, even with the liquid it won't completely dry out in the freezer. And you can keep it fresh like that for I don't know how long, for a week or two. Um, it'll stay. Some of the colors like burnt umber, the phthalo blue, some of those will get hard, will form a skin faster than some of these other colors, but even they will stay fluid longer in the freezer overnight. Let me know in the comments below if you have hacks like this, way that you save your oil paints. I've heard some artists say they keep their brushes in the freezer as well. I don't do that. I just rinse my brushes out with a little bit of Gamsol at the end of the day and then I have a brush dip formula that I got from Mark Cater. He has a great YouTube channel, lots of helpful information. I dip my brushes in that brush dip at the end of each day and set them aside and then they're ready to go the next day. Now if I'm going to be gone for a few weeks, I'll go ahead and wash my brushes with Master's brush soap rather than leaving them with that brush dip coating. I have my palette laid out here. Same standard order I go in. Same colors that I use plain air. I may not use all of these colors every time plain air, but I always pull from this general batch. So I've got titanium white, cerulean blue, cobalt blue, phthalo blue, ultramarine blue. You can tell I like the blues. I've got kind of a cool, almost yellowish blue, a warm, tending toward purple with a cobalt blue. And these are a little lighter and a little more opaque. And these are more transparent, a cool and a warm, phthalo and ultramarine. I, I find those really helpful in creating all the greens here in the Pacific Northwest. I usually only have one green on my palette, which is sap green. This is a Windsor & Newton sap green. I really like Rembrandt's sap green, probably even better than Windsor & Newton. The Rembrandt just has a little higher pigment load, but the Windsor & Newton is good quality. 
and definitely a little more affordable. Burnt Umber, Burnt Sienna, Alizarin Crimson, Cad Red, Cad Yellow, Windsor and Newton, Lemon Yellow, Gamblin Radiant Yellow, and Yellow Ochre. And then here are some colors that I just had mixed up left over from yesterday's paint session. What I'm going to do as I finish up this plein air painting in the studio is I'm going to use the reference photo for detail but I'm going to use my painting that I started for color reference. You can see here in the reference photo look at that blue sky it's just kind of flat one tone which is it's kind of boring I mean it's kind of poster like so it has an interesting graphic quality but it's just so flat but you can see from my painting there was a lot more variation in the color that day kind of lavender tones here as it gets closer to the mountain maybe some yellow also in the blue so I'm going to refer here to my plein air for the color same thing throughout I didn't get much of this foreground in but you can tell it had kind of a sap green cad yellow burnt sienna harmony so I'll stick with that I'm not going to try to copy these colors too closely there's a lot more burnt umber even some ultramarine blue here and even some phthalo blue here I'm not going to lean too far that direction I'm going to stay closer to the harmony that I captured on that day I'm also going to use similar brushes to what I used on that day to stay consistent with what I started. That way the painting will hopefully end up with kind of a plein air painterly effect, not such a highly finished, uh, very realistic, photorealistic painting. I can do those. I have done very photorealistic paintings before, but that's not what I'm going for here. I'm just going to finish up this plein air painting. I'm using the same mediums that I use when I'm painting outdoors as well. I've got a little bit of liquid and a little bit of Gamsol plus my normal painting medium which is a part stand oil, one part Gamsol, and one part walnut alkyd. These are just some paint, some paints that I have left over from the painting I was working on yesterday. They're mixed from the same basic palette, so I have no problem dipping into them and using them to create these mixtures. In fact, it's kind of a shortcut. Paying attention to the values here using my value scale. So for the sky, I want to stay in these lower three. I want to compress the sky values. Even though the reference photo may show a little darker blue to help the drama in my painting, I'm going to compress the sky values into these three lightest value families. I don't know if it's coming out on the video, but I can tell that that color I've mixed is a little too dark and a little too cool, not enough red. It needs a little bit of cad red, a little bit of alizarin crimson added to bring it up and a little bit of white to bring it up to what I'm seeing in the painting. It's a little closer, but even this is, is more red. So I need more red in my blue to match the color I saw that day. That's very close. I've mixed the colors for the sky now and for the mountain. 
in shadow and the very peaks so I can adjust the edge of the sky. I want to keep as much of the painting I have there as possible, but I do need to adjust the drawing a little bit. You can see this ridge is a little boring, the way it just kind of goes doot doot. I want to add a little bit of the variation I see in the drawing. Not too much, I don't want it to be too zigzaggy, but just a little bit of interest there. In the, in the photo you can see it comes down a little bit and then goes back up and then drops off at an angle, so I want to clean that up just a little bit. The rest of the drawing looks pretty close, so I want to firm that silhouette up just a little. Consolidate the shadows. Consolidate the lights. I'm using this large rosemary evergreen long flat. This is a number 10. It's probably close to an inch or maybe a hair wider. It's a nice synthetic brush. It's stiff but it's still soft and it has a lot of spring since it's a long flat. I'll use that for the sky and then I'll switch to a little smaller brush for the mountain. I'm reading Hawthorne's book, an old classic. He didn't actually write it but his students wrote down some of his teachings and his comment about painting outdoors and painting in general is try to capture the correct color. So a lot of the art instruction, art tutorials I've seen have talked a lot about drawing comes first, being a And I do believe that. I think if you can't draw, then you're gonna have a hard time painting anything close to realistically. Your drawing will be off. But Hawthorne's point was more the color has to be right. So the outdoor color has to be right and it has to be bold. You should consolidate the lights and consolidate the shadows and the edge where the light meets the shadow is really critical. Having a beautiful silhouette that really takes you to that moment is the most important thing. He talks a lot about having big planes, big notes of color being the most critical thing in an oil painting. I hope you can see here the benefit of premixing your colors. I'm just going directly from the piles on my palette onto the panel. It takes the guesswork away, makes it really efficient to paint. I can dip into full color and tilt things a little bit one way or the other if I want to. Like I've done here, you can see I've added a little bit of alizarin crimson here to tilt that a little more red and I've added some the radiant yellow to tip it a little more yellow on this side. Also using the big brush it keeps me, prevents me from being too finicky. I, I can't get real, I can get pretty sharp detail by painting with the corner or painting on the edge but I can't get too finicky with this big brush which is good. I don't want to get too finicky on this painting. I want to keep that spontaneous plain air look. You might notice that I've painted over the edge of the mountain. So I've got fresh wet paint down coming over the edge. That'll actually help me. Now when I go back in and redraw the outline of the mountain with wet paint, it'll be wet into wet. It'll make, it'll make it easier to control than if I was painting wet on the dry where it would look too hard. I'll switch to a number six ivory short flat by Rosemary & Co. This is just slightly smaller than the one I was using for the sky. It's still pretty big. It's still big enough that it'll give me nice brushwork, kind of loose looking brushwork, not too finicky.
very light, very high value colors of white for snow. It's really pretty close to almost pure white. Just one step up in value. I've got a little bit of a warm yellow red, a little bit of a cool lavender, and then a, an alizarin crimson, just a hint of alizarin crimson and yellow to cover the different colors in the snow that I saw that day. add just a little bit of really bright, slightly golden highlights on the snow close to the center of interest, which is that peak. I want, it, I want the highlights on the snow to actually kind of aim toward that peak, lead the eye to that peak. So to create really vibrant white, take pure white, that's as that's as vibrant as you're going to get, but it's cool. So I want to add just a little bit of a golden hue. So I take just a touch of burnt sienna and a touch of cad yellow and mix them on the side. This will go a long way, so be careful. Add just a little bit of liquid. I've been playing with this Dorland wax as well. I heard that on a video from John McDonald that he uses it to give kind of a nice thickness to his paint and a matte finish which sounded interesting. So I'm going to add just a little bit of Dorland wax to my brightest values, my lightest values. I'm not going to add it to the dark values because I don't really want a lot of thickness in my darks, but in my lights I'd like to get a little bit of thickness. So just a little of this will go a very long way, so I'm going to be careful as I add it to the white to control it. I want the lightest possible value, highest possible value, with just a touch of gold. So <laughs> just that little bit may have done it. That may have given me what I wanted. You can see as I mix that clean titanium white in, it is cool. It's almost, it's pure white, but it's almost blue compared to this golden hue. So just the slightest amount of this pigment will really influence that whole batch of, of white very quickly. Fold it up against my paint. Holding it against my painting, that's almost there. I think it needs just a touch more gold to knock the coolness of that white down. If you want to add a very clean color note, use a palette knife. You won't blend into the lower layers of paint as easily.
now to soft the edges of those really vibrant white notes I put down I'll add just a little bit of another pigment a little bit of blue a little bit of lavender to smooth in some of the edges not all often when you put a note down with a knife one of the edges will be perfect and maybe the other three edges will be wrong so you might have to correct a little bit by blending or adding another note on top when I'm mixing color I'd like I'd like to leave it as unmixed as I can so there's some variation of color in there and as you know from watching my videos I like to use this gradient this value scale and try to group my colors that I use into these seven groupings that way if all these values are similar it'll look more interesting if I place those colors side by side now I'll mix up the colors for the foreground I want to keep that very loose so I'll mix up a reddish dark and a greenish dark and those are not the darkest value I can mix they're one step above that darkest value I achieve that darkest value with a little bit of phthalo blue, burnt umber, and alizarin crimson. Those transparent colors mixed with just a little bit of medium make a very dark transparent color. These colors are one step above that. I'm preserving that darkest dark for some final touches if I can. I can add just a few touches of the darkest dark to my painting if I think something really needs to pop and hopefully that is close to one of the centers of interest. As I paint this foreground I'm going to do it in my typical way. I'm going to start with the farthest back and the darkest and then build on that and then if there is anything growing on top of something then I paint the substrate, the rock, the ground first and then I paint the moss or the bushes or the trees that grow on top of that next. If a tree has a trunk then I paint the trunk first and then I paint the branches and then I finally paint the the foliage. So kind of a back to front dark to light and center of growth out. That's kind of the methodology I use and sometimes I diverge from that sometimes I play and sometimes I go back and forth but in general that's my approach and it helps to build up the layers and that sense of illusion. I find if I start with lights, if I paint the lights first then the colors can get muddy. I like to paint the darks first and then try to leave them alone and then paint in the light areas. Sometimes I'll cross over a dark area with lights and that's okay if a little bit of dark mixes into the light it's not a big deal it kind of gives a nice soft edge nice soft effect sometimes a useful gradient but I find if I try to paint a dark over a wet light it just turns that dark muddy milky lightens it which is not what you want start with this fairly stiff rosemary evergreen short flat it's got some stiffness to it, but it has a nice soft edge and a sharp edge. You can see I'm following the landscape. I'm following the marks that I put down on site in that foreground. Even that initial wash gives me a lot of information and I'm following that with my painting now. And I'm also looking at the reference photo and following that landscape at least where I like it, where it makes sense. Now I'll switch to this Rosemary Masters short flat. Same size, number six, but it's much softer. It's like a fake mongoose brush. Uh, I'm going to use that now for the foliage.
finished painting. I tried to keep it as loose and quick as I could, as much like I would at plain air to keep it all consistent. I do kind of like how this is just a continuous band, that mountain in the distance. Looking at it now, it could be a touch lighter in value. This mountain could be just a a bit lighter, but then I'd need to also raise the value of the sky to keep that nice contrast. I'll put it aside and let it dry, look at it again. I can always come back in later and do a scumble of a lighter blue tone across this portion. Keep the snow, I like the, the value and the variation in the snow, but just do a little glaze, kind of a scumble of a light whitish blue across the mountain in the sky to push it further back. I might do that. But for now it's it's finished. I kept the foreground very loose. I didn't want that to distract really from this area. This is really the, the center of interest right in here. I wanted to keep the center of interest there. But I think you can still tell what the foreground is. Got a nice road coming down and back. So there's kind of a, there's an implied path into the painting to get up and lead you in, into the, the view. Well that's it. Thank you so much for joining me. As always, if you like these videos, please like and subscribe. Leave a comment below and I'll look for you on the next video.